Jesus Christ set aside his Godhead. excited about today. I don't know how many of y'all realize this, but this is Super Bowl Sunday. And I'm sure I'm not the only one here who will be rooting for Patrick Mahomes from the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Becky is fond of saying we practically raised him. Now, we've never met him, but she's very fond of saying we practically raised him, as long as people understand she's making that up. Uh, no, uh, Patrick Mahomes is, is a, a Texas Tech fella, and we will be cheering for him. And if you are watching this and you are a fan of Tom Brady or a fan of the Buccaneers, that's okay. God is merciful. <laughs> that's point number one. Point number two, I'm really stoked about Jarrett teaching next Sunday in this class. Pastor Jarrett uh, jumped at the opportunity. We've got Pastor David coming back in March to teach on a day that I'm gone in March. But, but when it came up that I was going to be out of town next Sunday, uh, uh, I was talking to Pastor Jarrett and I said, you, you know, you're always going to be first. He says, I want it. I want it. And I said, well, I mean, don't feel obligated. I want it. I said, but I know you're trying to teach the chapel. I don't care. Ryling can teach the chapel. I want it. So he's really stoked about being here. And it makes me not want to go out of town so I can be here. But then I realized I can watch it virtually. And those of you who are joining us virtually, uh, welcome. Uh, around the world, we, we have people watching virtually. And it's a delight to be here. Third item, and then we'll get started. When I was growing up, we didn't call these life groups. We called them Sunday school. And we got our Bibles and we were in school and we studied. Dr. Sherry, you're nodding your head. You called it Sunday school. And we studied. Today we're going to have some Sunday school. So if you're very familiar with your Bible, it's going to be very easy for you to follow. If you are not very familiar with your Bible, we're going to make it easy to follow anyway. And when you walk out of here, you're going to think, whew, we are studying Galatians. And this is our fourth week. Week one, I talked about how serious this study is using Paul's language to show how serious it is. Week two, we talked about the power and sanctity of of the gospel and I said when Paul uses the word gospel he has a particular meaning if you look up in a Greek lexicon what does gospel mean you'll see that it means uh, referencing God it's God's good news to humans or just simply good news it's certainly used way outside of the scope of just referencing God it was a common word in some ways commonly used in both the noun form, euangelion, as a noun gospel, but also in a verb form of delivering or speaking good news. And so we've got that, but when Paul uses it, and I've specified Paul, Paul, most every time he uses the term, is referencing that's right, Ava. Christ died for our sins, was resurrected, as will be those who are in him. And Paul has that specific event, if you will, in mind. So last week I talked about that as the authentic gospel, the idea that God's good news to humans is that Christ died for our sins and was resurrected as will be those who are in him. That is the great news. This week, week four, I'm going to talk about how that's the center of the Christian life. I'm calling it the centric gospel. Now, 
I had planned this class. I'd worked on this class. I'd translated Galatians for this class. I was really excited to teach this class. And then something happened yesterday afternoon. Actually, it didn't happen for me until last night as I was going to bed and I checked my emails. You see, we have a problem in this class. The problem is the size of the class. The size of this class makes it impossible for us to do Q&A. It's near impossible for you to raise your hand. Ow. I got my second vaccination shot yesterday in this arm. And oh, by the way, now all of y'all are going to email me and say, but I thought you don't trust Big Pharma. What are you doing getting the vaccine? I don't trust Big Pharma, but I don't trust the corona either. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, not lifting this arm, I'll lift my throwing arm. Um, the you, you can't raise your hand and say, I have a question. At least not comfortably. I guess you could. but So the way we normally do that is y'all shoot emails. Here's a question. I try to shoot emails back. Here's an answer. And I get a few questions every week and I try to get them back. That's pretty normal. You got any questions? Just shoot them. Want more? At biblical-literacy.org. Biblical Y'all can shoot your questions there. I'll shoot you my best answers back. If you're watching this on the internet, you can pause it for a moment and make a copy of that. And email us to your heart's delight. But last night, as I'm going to sleep, I checked my emails. And I have this long question from someone in class who's well-studied. Someone in class who is a personal friend. Someone in class who's wrong. <laughs> on some things, I believe. Who believes I'm wrong on some things, I suspect. And so I got up at 3.30 this morning. And I totally rewrote class. Because we're going to do Q&A. But it's the email that I got sent. Because I think it allows us to really make an important point about what Paul is saying in Galatians. And I don't want it to be missed. So please work with me this morning. Here is the beginning of the 50-page email. It's entitled, The Gospel, follow-up to last week's lesson. And this friend, who I will not name because I don't want to embarrass him, says, I started this last Sunday, but put it aside until I had time to think through it a bit. Here goes. In summary, I think you're, he's talking about me, shortchanging at least in the lesson, what the gospel is and what Paul and the gospel writers meant by seemingly, by me, seemingly limiting the gospel to the death, burial, and resurrection. As Tom Wright would say, yes, that's certainly good news, but there's more to it than that. Stop! 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 Right there. That is the gospel. And we have nothing to add to it. That doesn't mean other things aren't relevant. But it means they draw their meaning from the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That good news permeates through all of your theology and your ideas... And it is the center for all of your theology and all your ideas. And if we lose that focus, or if we start adding to it, we're doing a disservice. And we need to be careful. 
Now, why do I say this? And why do I say it with such emphasis? Get ready. I'm about to uncork. Limber up. Oh, okay. Look at this. In summary, I think you're shortchanging, at least in the lesson, what the gospel is and what Paul and the gospel writers. Time out. Gospel writers, I'm not including in this. I think by the time you read the gospel of John, 50 years almost after Paul wrote his, the church has begun to understand more, the Holy Spirit has revealed more, and words are not always used in the precise same way. But Paul is writing this Galatian letter, and one of the points of emphasis that I want to always make is this is within 15 years of the resurrection of Jesus. This is fresh. Sometimes I think about my faith and I think, you know, this is kind of weird because I believe, but do I believe because I believe or because my parents believed and I was brought up in a home where they believed? And do they believe because they believe or did dad believe because mom taught dad the gospel? And did mom believe because she believed or was it because her mother taught it to her? Or her grandmother, who learned it from an evangelist, who learned it from another evangelist, who learned it from a seminary, who learned it from a church, who learned it from a blah, 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 and the chain has to go back 2,000 years, and you wonder how solid is the foundation on which we stand. But the whole point of Paul and what I was trying to make in this Galatian lesson is he was an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. He is the first touch. And when we understand what he undeniably wrote within 15 years of that first touch, we are the second touch. I'm not standing on a gospel that was taught to me by my mom or by Tom Wright or by a sem who, who, who learned it from a seminary or self-study or learned it from here or there and back and back. No, I just want to sit firmly on what the Apostle Paul, who was an eyewitness, I want to sit firmly on what he had to say. And I think when I do that, you're going to sit there with me and you're going to see that the gospel that Paul, when Paul used that word, gospel. Paul means the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that we are joined in that when we put our faith in him. Now, that's the gospel as Paul uses it. That's the good news. You say, well, okay, how do we determine that? Look at writings of the apostle Paul. Shall we start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17? Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Euangelizomai is, is uh, or euangelistai is the form here, but that's the verb form. Preach the gospel. What do you mean, Paul? Mark says you mean the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Yes. And look what Paul says. I preach the gospel, but not with words of eloquent wisdom, Sophia Logu. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. See, the gospel he preached is the cross of Christ. And he didn't do it with fancy schmancy words because the cross of Christ itself has the power, not the fancy schmancy words. The word of the cross, it's folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The dunamis, the way God powerfully works, of God it is. That's put in a position of emphasis, power of God it is. To those of us who are being saved. 
The gospel that Paul preached is the cross of Christ in all of its power to save. Say, I mean, it, in court, I could like say, thank you, Your Honor, case closed. But we've got a little more time. Let's keep reading in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. That's his gospel. Christ crucified. Now that's a stumbling block to Jews. That's folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks, Christ crucified. Christ is the power of God, is the wisdom of God. This Christ crucified that he preached is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. It is the center of everything. It is the gospel. It is the good news. Christ died for our sins. He was resurrected as will be those who are in him. It is the reason why Paul continues. Because of him, you. I put you not only in yellow but in red. Do you know why? Because Paul says it twice in the Greek. He says, you, Hamas. And then the next word, esti, is the verb that's also got you built into it. So you, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of him, you are in. Remember the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and us who are in him, who share in that. You are in him who became to us wisdom from God, your righteousness that word righteousness, dikaiosune, is a legal word. It's a courtroom word. It means not guilty. It means the judge has declared you not guilty. It means you've come to court. Satan, the accuser, is accusing you of being unworthy of God's presence. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. You've done bad things. You've thought bad things. You haven't exhibited the kind of self-control you should. You've been wicked. You've been evil. You've been wrong. And you say, not I. You're haughty if you say, not I. And so you're hauled in front of the court and Satan who Revelation calls the accuser of the brethren. He's the prosecuting attorney and he's pointing his finger at you. And God, the ultimate judge, pronounced you, you dikaiosune, with righteousness, not guiltiness, justified, A-OK, -okay, clean as a whistle, because Christ died for your sins, was resurrected, and you by faith have joined in that. That is your righteousness. That is your hagiosmos, your sanctification. That is the power and the source of what sets you apart and makes you different than anybody who's not redeemed. That is also your redemption. Apolutrosis is, is uh, the, the word for how you buy back a slave or let a slave go free. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free, redeemed us, set us free from the law of you sin, you die. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't die but will live ever after. That's the good news. And Paul continues. So the one who wants to boast better boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you brothers, didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech and fancy theology. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Period. Brother Paul, I decided to know nothing among you except the gospel, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I didn't add on a bunch of other stuff. It's not Jesus plus. It's Christ and him crucified. 
And that is all. Ekrina, I decided to know among you, in you, Ame, only Jesus Christ and Him being crucified. That's it. That's the story. And so when you see the cross of Christ and you see the gospel, if you look at the chapel we built, it's in the shape of a cross. The Byzantines in the 400s and the 500s and the 600s built their churches in the shape of a cross. We've got builders and engineers in here who know about foundations. The first thing you build when you build a building is the foundation. And they built their buildings in the shape of a cross so the church could see the foundation of the church is the cross. No more, no less. When we built our chapel, and our chapel is it's a replica of one that was built in 500 A.D., and our chapel is built like this. In the shape of the cross. Because that's the way they built them. When we were building it, Becky came out one day and she said, Mark, this isn't going to do. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, think about all the different events and stuff that will happen out here. I said, yeah. She said, where's the restroom? I said, you make a great point. She said, can you knock a hole out of the wall and put a restroom in it? I said, no. The shape of the cross is the foundation of the church, not the shape of the cross plus a restroom. So we built the restroom across in a different building. This is the church's foundation. This is, and if you go into our chapel and you look backwards from, this, from the center of it, you look back, what you see are painting after painting after painting of Old Testament stories that speak of the cross of Christ. The very first panel is one of, of, of uh, God creating humanity. You say, well, how does that speak of the cross of Christ? Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 1. He chose us in Christ. Christ is the hymn. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before God. We're not holy and blameless because of us. I mean, I'm looking out. I know you people. Y'all are great people to varying degrees. But I'm not putting my money on any of y'all for being holy and blameless before God. In love, God predestined us. He planned this from the beginning that we would be adopted to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's blessed us in the beloved. Now, someone in here who sent me this email has made a good point that I'll get to later about how Paul frequently, especially in these later letters, which is where I classify Ephesians, uses language that the local Gentile population would know is kind of Roman king type language. And uh, since Caesar, Julius Caesar, was dead, when Julius Caesar's will was read, in his will, after his death, he adopted as a son his nephew, Octavius. And once he adopted him as his son, not only did Octavius come into like mooey, 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 mucho wealth, but also arguably got to be the next Caesar, took the name Caesar as an adopted son. Julius Gaius Caesar, and then Octavius gets adopted and becomes Augustus Caesar, who is the Caesar at the time Jesus is born. But... 
after Julius Caesar was dead, Augustus made a big deal about the fact that Julius Caesar was divine. He made the proclamation during the birthday of Julius Caesar in a big event that was happening because this comet streaks across the sky. And he said, that's the soul of Julius Caesar going to be with the gods where he belongs. Of course, if you're the son of Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar is a god, what does that make you? A son of God. Divini filium in Latin. And that's what he was called. So, I mean, Paul's going to use language that will echo some concepts in the minds of his readers because we've been predestined, but our adoption to God as sons is through Jesus Christ. It comes no other way. He doesn't adopt us because he likes our name. He doesn't adopt us because he likes our hair. Or lack thereof. He doesn't adopt us because Miss Carolyn wears pretty hats. He, he didn't adopt us because Scott's got really cool looking glasses. He adopts us because he can through the death of his son because he loves us. But it's through his son that we're adopted. It's through the sacrifice. That's good news. That we're adopted according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, his gift, which is another Pauline term for the death of Christ. That he's lavished upon us. So you see, even in creation, the cross of Christ is there. And you can walk through the other panels and you can see that even as Eve sins and Adam's over here saying, save me a bite. Dummies. You can see as they're being kicked out of the garden, the promise of the sacrifice of Christ. It doesn't simply say that one from woman will bruise the head of the serpent. But it says it will come at a cost because the serpent will bruise his heel. And you can keep walking, but these are visions of the cross. The Abraham story, sacrificing Isaac. And as he goes to sacrifice Isaac... Isaac says, where's the sacrificial lamb? And Abraham doesn't put up a mirror and say, look in here, son. Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb. And he did. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And all that that entails. So you see in the stories of Moses and the Exodus when they are about to leave Egypt and the angel of death is going to visit and wipe out the firstborn. Exodus 12 says, kill the Passover lamb. These are God's instructions. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin after you've sacrificed the lamb. And then touch the lintel and the two doorposts. The lintel and the two doorposts. Make the shape of a cross out of the blood of the Lamb. And the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the doorpost in the shape of the cross, the Lord will pass over the door and won't allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. That's the cross of Christ. The good news is that that was fulfilled. It's no longer symbolic. It's no longer prophetic. It's actual and for real. Christ died for our sins. He was resurrected as will be those who are in him. And that is the cross of Christ. And that defines the past. And it also, if you look at the front of the church, explains the future. That Christ will come again. 
that Christ will continue to complete the good work of making things right. And that's what we've got. That's the gospel. Is that Christ died for our sins, was resurrected, and will come again to claim those who are with him. Now, you may want to say, wait a minute. Now you're saying you're going to claim us and cart us off to heaven. Well, I have some interesting news for you. The Bible doesn't teach you that you're going off to heaven to live eternally. The Bible teaches you that God will create a new heaven and earth. You will live eternally. Access to the tree of life. But you will be in a bodily form. How we're going to be? Paul said, I don't know. But it will be imperishable. So we're not some disembodied spirit floating on the plasma of heaven for eternity. We're made, spirit, soul, and body is one. And our eternal life is one that experiences itself in physical means in somehow. But that doesn't change the fact that we still appear before God in judgment. Now, so am I shortchanging the gospel by limiting it to the death, burial, and resurrection? No, that is the core of everything. The email continued, I'm certain you know this. But I have to reiterate, I'm convinced that the good news is more than just that. That is the good news. That's the gospel when Paul uses the word gospel. I'm not saying it doesn't have ramifications for life. I'm not saying it doesn't fit into the cosmic love story, which is detailed in Scripture. I'm not saying it doesn't have ramifications for what the future will be. But when Paul uses that word gospel, we must be clear. He's not talking about our response and what we do. He's not talking about our duties. He's not talking about our obligations. We are not saved because of anything we do. We are saved solely on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and being found in Him. That's it. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That's my whole point. That's the gospel. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, my friend in email says, in accordance with scriptures is in line with what the Old Testament teaches. That's what N.T. Tom Wright refers to as the single plan of God for the world. The promised Messiah has come. Jesus is now king. As a result of his death and crucifixion, the world has changed. Everything's now different. But that's just part of the story. That's God's single plan for the world? Yes, if you're talking about the gospel being the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But you start adding to the gospel, and that's not God's single plan for the world. Jesus is now king. Jesus was king before. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ did not suddenly make him king. Pilate says to Jesus, are you a king? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my soldiers would rise up and fight you. He doesn't say, well, I'm not a king yet, but I might be after this uh, resurrection if it all works out according to plan. He's already king. This world is under a curse. Don't start thinking he's going to become king of the cursed world. He's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth where he reigns eternally as king. This one will be discarded. Rolled away, Paul says. So, now king? (laughs) Jesus is king. Everything is now different. Crucifixion, his death and crucifixion. The world has changed. (laughs) Depends on how you're saying it. I mean, this is still a fallen world. This is still a world of sin. Paul will still call Satan the prince of demons of this world. 
Now, he's, the prince of demons of this world stands judged. He stands condemned. But this is not the eternal world that we will inhabit. It's not. It will be rolled away. And a new heaven and a new earth created. But Jesus, yes, he's king. He's always been king. But if you see a Byzantine painting of Jesus, like we have in our chapel ceiling, they rightfully paint him most often with nail holes in his hands and feet. Look at them. Nail holes. Because he reigns as a crucified Messiah. And so the center of everything is the cross and Jesus. And that's the good news. That's the center of our faith. Now, the email continued, as you may be able to tell from the passion in this email, this has really hit home for me the past year. The gospel is more than just getting your ticket punched for heaven. When we limit our description of the gospel to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we tend to shortchange people the full message of the gospel. No! Emphatic, no! That is the full message of the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, resurrected, and will come again to claim those who are in him. That is the gospel. That's the good news. That is what's by which we are saved, by which we stand before God, righteous, justified, not guilty, with righteousness, dikaiosune. That's it. No. We don't shortchange it. We magnify it. Let me be more emphatic. No. Let me be more emphatic. No. The Gospels spend the vast majority of their time on the life and ministry of Jesus and relatively little on the resurrection. No! The whole God... Look, that's like saying... Okay, take a really good uh, classic movie. I mean, like one that nobody's going to debate. It's clearly one of the best movies ever made. Um, you're, half of you, at least, are thinking the same thing I am. Good, bad, and the ugly. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> it's a really long movie. At the end, you have the big showdown between the good, Clint Eastwood, the bad, Lee Van Cleef, and the ugly, Eli Wallach. And they're all three trying to get the treasure. Now, 90% of the movie is not about that scene. But the whole movie is about that scene. Everything else is the buildup that gives meaning to the scene. So you see in the Gospels repeatedly stories and actions by Jesus and others that are echoes of the prophetic statements about who the Messiah will be. And all of them culminate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Look at the Gospel of John. It's got several chapters, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Yes, they're at the end, but it starts out with the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word dwelt, paris kaneo in the Greek, is the word for tabernacle, the, the, the tent of meeting where God met with the people. Because this whole thing is God meeting with the people. And so John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, that's not directly a story of the resurrection and the crucifixion, but it's clearly a reference to it. And you get that over and over and over. The email continued, The full message of the gospel, to my understanding, includes God created a perfect world and placed humans in it to care for it. Yes, but... Let's add to it, knowing that the humans would flub it, that's theology, flub it, and that he would send Christ to restore and make things right in that relationship. That wasn't, you know, the crucifixion's not plan B. Adam and Eve chose to do their own thing rather than obey God, resulting in a broken world. Yes. 
But God knew ahead of time they were going to. And had already made provision for it. God wasn't surprised by that. He had a plan all along to restore our relationship with him. Amen. That plan was initiated through the covenant with Abraham. That plan was initiated before that. But let's take this one at a time. God created a perfect world? Yes. The cross is part of that. Adam and Eve chose to do their own thing? Yes. And God says, I'm going to send Jesus because of that. God wasn't surprised by that. That's true. The plan was not, all, uh, um, not initiated through the covenant with Abraham, continued with the covenant in Abraham. It's already been initiated in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Christ had already made the decision as God that he was coming to redeem humanity before he made humanity. God's, so I, I take out initiated. God's plan continued through Moses, David, the prophets, and was ultimately fulfilled in the Messiah Jesus, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. As a result, the world has been and is continuing to be eh, reconciled to God. Through the finished work of Jesus, God invites us to join him in that work as the true image bearers of God. That's not gospel. The response that we have is not part of the gospel that saves us. And it should never be confused as part of the gospel. I don't care how good you are. There is a difference between duty and effort that is is earning. And we must be very careful never to confuse the two. Paul will say later in Galatians, it's the only time in Scripture you read about people falling from grace. And he says the people who fall from grace are the people who try to justify themselves by what they do. And we must never, ever confuse as part of the gospel that we are joining with God in the work as true image bearers. Yes, he invites us, but that's not the gospel. That's not what Paul means when he writes of the gospel. That's what Paul means how we respond to the gospel. That is sanctification, not justification. Okay? It continued. I told you it's long and I've cut some out. I hope I've been fair though. Jesus' death and resurrection wasn't just to save us from our sins and their effects and get us to heaven when we die. I fear that's what too many Christians believe because we have a tendency to limit the gospel. Well then let's don't limit the gospel. The gospel's unlimited salvation for everyone, but let's be sure we talk about the response to the gospel. Let's don't change what the gospel is from what Paul said it was, but let's do talk about the importance of how we respond and live in response to the gospel. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think the good news that Paul and the gospel writers were sharing would have been limited to that. When we hear he'll save his people from their sins, there's a significant tendency to internalize that as, I've committed sins, Jesus will save me from them and their effects. While there's a lot of truth to that statement, leaving it at that tends to make it all about me and my salvation. It makes it easy to leave out the effect the gospel should have outside our personal life and in our interaction with the world. (laughs) The, The irony of this human life we have. Is God, 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 God gives us this life and tells us, in essence, from God's perspective, it's all about you. It is all about you. He's doing all of this for you. Our problem is, we're so narcissistic, we just trying to take that and like, oh, I guess it's all about me. I'm not surprised. Becky's same way. It's all about me. No. Our response should be right, which is, no, it's not all about us. It's all about God. It is all about God. 
When we sing a song of praise to the Lord and we clap afterwards, don't ever clap because the worship team did real good. They always do real good. But we clap because we're honoring God. When y'all twice clapped after class, now y'all, y'all are good about that sometimes, but only when God has been lifted up because we're clapping to Him. This isn't about me. This isn't about you. For us, it's all about Him. But for Him, it's about us. Jesus did not come and die because of what He got out of it. This was not, hey man, it's Salvation Sunday, what a deal. I think I'll go down there and save me some people so I can have little sycophants run around and worship me and help me out. No, he doesn't need us. We don't do something for him. He is totally self-sufficient within the Trinity. He's got relationship, he's got love, he's got self-sustainability. We are who we are, and the gospel is what the gospel is because it's his just unparalleled love for everyone who hears this message. Look at Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to save. And if you want to interpret the word gospel, when Paul uses it, to include our response... You have just become a works-based believer. And those are the ones Paul says need to be accursed in Galatians 1, 7, and 8. The gospel is God's power to save us. Euangelion, gospel, is God's power to soterion, to save us. Everyone, Ponte, who believes... Jew or Greek, look at this. In him, in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. Toangelion tes soterios, the gospel of your salvation. It's, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is the story of, uh, it's the event. It's the historical event of how we're saved. And that is the What? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Period. That's the good news. That is the gospel. That is the power of God to save. The power of God to save is not, I'm going to make you an image bearer so you help me do things on earth. If we had time, I would take you to Acts 16.25. Acts 17.16. Those are Paul teaching. Paul in Acts uh, 16.25 is the Philippian jailer story. And Paul's in jail in Philippi. And there's an earthquake and the gates open. And Paul doesn't leave. And the Philippian jailer asks Paul, says to Paul, um, well, if I'm going to tell it, I might as well show it. Dumb me. 1625. The jailer wakes up. 1627. The jailer wakes up, sees the prison doors are open. He draws his sword. He's going to do Harry Carey because he's going to get killed by the Romans if he let the prisoners escape. But Paul says, hey, don't stop. We're here. Jailer says, get me some lights in here. Everybody rushes in. With trembling, he falls down before Paul and Silas. He brings them out. He says, sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul doesn't say, well, it's not all about you. Paul doesn't give him a grand theology tour. Paul tells him the good news. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to them and they got up and they were baptized that very night. Look at Paul in Athens in in Acts chapter 17. Paul stands up and says, men, well go up before that. While Paul was waiting for the 
folks to join him in Athens. His spirit was provoked as he saw the, all the idols. He reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews, but in the marketplace he went. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers conversed with him. What does this babbler say? He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's the gospel message. That's what he was teaching. Paul says, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets. When God judges the secrets of men, it will be by Jesus Christ, not by whether or not you were a good image bearer. When you are judged according to Paul's gospel, Paul's message of good news, it's that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and resurrected. And when you read that word gospel, you need to have that image in your brain as Paul uses it. I think a huge part of Paul's message was that there's a new king, literally. If I understand correctly, Paul and the gospel writers borrowed the term gospel from the Roman world, where it referred specifically to the good news that a new king had been born. That would be how his audience in the Roman world would understand the term. No. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No. Um, not that there's a new king, first of all. We've already talked about that. But this idea that Paul and the gospel writers borrowed the term from the Roman world where it referred specifically to the good news that a new king had been born? No. No. And yes, depends on how you understand the word. But the whole idea of the gospel as Paul used it, especially in his early letters like Galatians, he's not writing to a Roman world about emperors and what Augustus Caesar claimed to have been or those after him. He's still talking about this, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins. And if you have any questions about where it came from, the word was in use for hundreds of years before Roman emperors. In the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, which is Paul's preferred version. Paul is quoting over and over and over in these letters from the Septuagint. You read the letter to Galatians and it's got some really tough theology because he's talking about Sarah and Hagar and the promises through Abraham. He's talking to people who understood their Old Testament. The Old Testament is clear. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation day to day. That is gospel. Tell the gospel of his salvation is the way the Greek reads. You and Galazis, this they. You and Galazis, they. From you and that, that, that is it. It's tell the good news, the gospel of his salvation is the way they translated it. Joel 2.32. It'll come to pass everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. That has said there is gospel as the Lord has gospelized it. That word is all over the Old Testament. You read Isaiah 40, which is an entire chapter about the coming Messiah. Verse 9 says, good news. That's what it is. So, no and yes. I mean, yeah, it would have some meaning. You can chase down some meanings in the Roman world. But that, and that's a good thread. But it's not the tapestry. It's not the tapestry. So if you want to email me questions, I'm glad to talk about it some more, but I have run out of time except to say this is the center of everything we understand. And if you want to read good books on this, I strongly recommend, if you want to understand how all things in the past go to the gospel and all things in the future flow from the gospel and all things in the present are found in the gospel, the gospel is the center. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the center of our core. It is, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's God's good news. Christ died for our sins. And Paul says, that's the core of everything. Here are the two books. Read Leon Morris, either the cross in the New Testament or the apostolic preaching of the cross. Amazing works, seminal works on this for me that teach me the gospel. Okay, we got to go to church. Let me bless you. Father, thank you for the patience of everybody who's endured this. But Lord, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from which I am justified, righteous, sanctified, set apart, 
predestined to be with you for eternity. May the power of your gospel go out from this message. The unadulterated, pure power of the resurrected Jesus, may it permeate all we are and all we do. And may we live in response to it. May we grow in the fruit of your spirit. Through Jesus our Lord, amen. See you guys next two weeks.